we have just summarized all the equivalences and the laws. Then the four quantifier laws that we propose for the first order logic. So, that along with all the laws of propositional logic, you can use these quantifier laws and then conclude about equivalences, validity or consequences. Right? So, we will take some examples today and see how does it go. Then it will also be coupled with symbolization. So, that symbolization will tell you how much you have understood about the first order semantics. Right? Because semantics is already involved in the symbolization itself. Right? So, let us try one. Okay, let us start uh, symbolization of this argument. So, we are not concerned now whether the argument will be true or false, whether that is a valid consequence or not. So, let us try to see how symbolization goes in. So, suppose first one we first identify the predicates and the connectives, there are no connectives used here, right. So, first one is something is a man, something is an animal. So, you need two predicates there, right. So, let us start with say m x means x is a man and a x means x is an animal. And then one more predicate will come here let us say q x means x is quadruped. Now, coming to the premises and the conclusion. So, first one no man is an animal, how do you symbolize it? First suggestion is do not write as it is as a first order sentence or first order formula. First try to translate with using variables and maybe open formulas, then try to see what quantifier you are going to use. Right? So, rewrite that in English using the variables. So, first one for example, no man is an animal. So, how do you write for each x? If something then something or it is not or there is something for which something else happens. Some way you have to write it right. So, let us say for each x if x is a man then x is not an animal. You may translate the meaning like this, we do not know till now whether it is correct or not. Right? Well, there can be on the other ways like no man is an animal, when can you say it is false? If you can find one man who is an animal, right? so it is not the case, right? where you can find one person or one object which is a man as well as an animal. Right? So, we might also write it is not the case that there exists an x which is both a man and an animal. Okay. Once you write this way, it will be easier for you to translate it to first order logic. Say for first one, if you proceed this way, you would be translating as for each x, if x is a man, then x is not an animal. Right? In the second way, you would write as it is not the case that there is one x which is both a man and an animal. Are they telling the same thing? Are they equivalent? We 
well you take this knot inside by de morgan so that gives you for each x not of mx and ax right not the is x x is same thing as for each x not x that is your de morgan's law so this comes now this will become for each x not mx or not ax okay so now not p or q is same thing as p implies q so you have p as mx here mx implies not ax it is the same thing right so any one of the ways you can proceed doesn't matter let's take one of them say first one so first sentence we wrote as for each x mx implies not ax what about the second one all animals are quadruped that's easy right for each x if something is an animal then it is quadruped so ax implies qx therefore what is the next last proposition here is last sentence no man is quadruped so again it is in the same form right in the first form so we can just write for each x if it is a man then it is not quadruped okay now suppose you want to prove this we don't know whether it's valid or not right let's try proving it which one you will take informal proof or huh? or calculation which one you want calculation okay so how do you start well there are only two you can start with and of both the premises it will not make much writing huh? so let's start with that for each x mx implies not ax and for each x ax implies qx so we apply quantifier law say universal specification on the first one let us say so let's write universal specification on the first one if you want to specify what x you are taking you may write x by c or x by x itself doesn't matter okay let's take x by x so that gives mx implies not ax and for each x ax implies qx now again we can apply us with the same x so mx implies not ax and ax implies qx okay now how to use both of them I'm see our aim is to get something with mx and not qx or mx qx ax should be eliminated it doesn't look i can eliminate ax had it been not ax i could have used hypothetical syllogism right okay or had it been not qx i could have also applied same way because contribution but nothing is there right so i'm stuck i can't proceed so it looks it need not be valid right well i am not able to do that's why i am thinking it can be invalid that is not a proof now to prove invalidity what you will do find one state okay which is not satisfying it right so that means you have to get a state which is a state model of both the premises but it is not a state model of the conclusion right this is what we want okay now how to proceed from there 
So, I have some a here in the domain, I have m of a, I know that is also not a of a, right. <coughs> then I have a, a implies q a, okay. Suppose m a is true, then I would get not a of a, so that a of a is false, so this will be vacuously satisfied. Right, because not A is true, so A is false. Once A is false, Q A will be true or false, it does not matter. The whole sentence will be correct, it is true. Then, in that case, I end with M A is true and not A is true. These are the two things, Q can be anything, right. Now, conclusion is conclusion is. M A implies not Q A. So, when M A is true, Q A should be false, right. Now, to give one counter example, I take Q A to be true instead of false, right. So, what it says that I should take M A as true, A A as false, Q A as true. If I try with that, then probably it should succeed. Is that okay? So, now how to declare all those things? See, this requires M A to be true. Let us write C instead of A, huh? it will be easy to speak now. So, A C will be false and Q C should be true, this is what I want. At least one A should be there for which this would happen. So, if I take only single element domain, say C and make a relation, where m c can be there, a c is not there. So, on a single element, how do we say a c is false? I take the relation to be empty relation, possible, I can take empty, right. Or if you take a two element set, you can take the other one to be true and this is false, right. So, let us try that, that will be easier to see. So, say let i be equal to d phi where d is a b and what is p prime? Let me write p prime here. Now, we want m, we want a, we want q, all these are required. So, one interpretation is enough because all these are sentences, I do not have to go to states. There is no free variable in either the premises or the conclusion. So, I just give one interpretation, right, which will falsify it, that is all. So, with this, we take m prime equal to m prime at c should be true, okay. We have c here and b, let us say. So, I should take c only. It is a unary relation, it is a subset of the domain D, right. So, I take only this subset c, and then I take a prime a prime at c should be false. So, c should not belong to a prime, right. So, I take only b. Now, q c should be true, right. So, I will take only q prime equal to c again. Is that okay? Then what we see? Then c belongs to m prime. Okay, and C does not belong to A prime, C belongs to Q prime, right. Therefore, therefore, what happens? I satisfies M X, not M X, we should have M C only. Right, but there is no C. So, you have to see first sentence for each x m x implies not q x. So, is it satisfied directly you can see or not? I C satisfies for each x m x implies not q x if and only if I have only two elements in my domain for each element I have to see if and only if 
So, first element is C if C belongs to M prime then C does not belong to Q prime and if B belongs to M prime then B does not belong to Q prime is it okay? We are going every step of the formal semantics. See for each x, mx implies not qx. So now this says x can be either c or b. For c, we will translate as mc implies not qc. It is really m prime. So that will be translated as c belongs to m prime. Then c does not belong to q prime. For c, for b similarly, if b belongs to m prime, then b does not belong to q prime. Right? Now with this data, what we see is C belongs to M prime. Okay. C belongs to Q prime also. Right. So C does not Q belong belong to Q prime. Says that first sentence itself is false. So the whole thing becomes false because it's aunt, right? Which is false. Right. But then, what we wanted? That is the conclusion. For each x, m x implies not q x. It is false. But to show that the consequence is invalid, we have to see also premises to be true. Right? This is not over yet. So we have to see all those things again. Let's try that. Now the first sentence will be: I satisfies for each x, m x implies not i x. So this holds if and only if again with C and B we will take. So with C it says if C belongs to M prime then C does not belong to A prime and if B belongs to M prime then C B does not belong to A prime. Now you have to use the data. C belongs to M prime. Yes. What about C does not belong to A prime? <coughs> that is also true. So the first if then holds. Right. Next one is B belongs to M prime. No, B does not belong to M prime. Therefore, vicariously that sentence also holds. Right. The if then sentence holds. Therefore, this is true. Now you go for the second premise. So that says I satisfies for each x, m x implies, sorry, a x implies q x. So this holds when if with C and with B, so if C belongs to a prime, then C belongs to q prime, and if B belongs to a prime. Then B belongs to Q prime. Okay. So now we use our data. C does not belong to A prime. So first sentence is vacuously true. Right. So second one is B. B belongs to A prime or not? B belongs to A prime. Yes. And does B belong to Q prime? No. But then it will be false. Right? No. We want to make this true. Right? So this will be true when for both the things it will be true. Fine. So C belongs to A prime. C must belong to Q prime. That is vicariously true because C does not belong to A prime. Now, what about B? B belongs to A prime. If B belongs to A prime, then B must also belong to Q prime, which is not the case. So, our model, what we have constructed, the interpretation, doesn't satisfy this premise. You may have to readjust. So, where to readjust? We include B here. Then you have to verify everything else also. Well, let's try that. Suppose this is B. 
so we have c belongs to k prime and b also belongs to q prime okay with this let us verify again so this wherever is q b there we have to check this anyway we don't bother one of them only not true so that is that passes what about the second one what about second one in second one there is no q so it holds as earlier now the third one if b belongs to a prime then b belongs to q prime that now holds so now it is all right interpretation is correct right it serves our purpose so you have shown that this interpretation satisfies both the premises but not the conclusion is that clear now look at this the way you have constructed you can make it better without going through all these discrete points say so what we have done m prime is c a prime is its complement in some sense right c is not there and q prime you could have taken the whole one right so suppose i interpret in the set of natural numbers i take m prime to be set of all prime numbers and a prime to be set of all composites let us say and q prime is everything of n now is it okay so first one let us try to read them this says if x is a prime number then x is not a composite number okay and this says if x is a composite number then x is a natural number yes and this says if x is a prime number then it is not a natural number that is creating problem so that is what we wanted right both should be true and this should be false now you see it is simplified so we start with that interpretation that might be easier right we just forget all these things but this is what formal semantics says you can always construct a model or so that it is invalid by semantics itself fine so even if you are misguided you will be getting the result somewhere but it could have been easier by that with our common sense is that clear so that's how you have to proceed to show whether it's valid or invalid for showing validity your laws might be helpful showing invalidity semantics will be helpful because laws can't say whether it is invalid or not so let's take de morgan's example see what happens hmm? all horses are animals therefore all legs of horses are legs of animals right this seems to be a valid argument okay now first thing is how to symbolize it should be easy yes so first one says i have to write one predicate with a checks x is a horse then a x x is an animal then the next one so i need a predicate leg right legs of horses leg of what so something can be a leg of something else right it's a binary predicate so let me take l x y x is a leg of y okay so first sentence is easy to symbolize the premise this says for each x h x implies a x therefore now all legs of horses are legs of animals how do you write it first with x y and semi formal english yes so is it that if x is leg of all horses then x is leg of all animals because all horses are some horses that we have to see and some leg or all leg that also we have to see right anything is possible there it's a binary predicate so is it that the sentence is telling you take x which is a leg of all horses 
then that is also a leg of all animals. There is no leg of all horses, right? Because if two different horses I am taking, their legs are also different, right? So I can take that there is one X which is leg of all the horses. Is that right? So what should I write? If X is a leg of some horse, then X is a leg of some animal. Is that right? And this X should be for each X, whatever X I take doesn't matter. Is that okay? So the semi-formal English says for each X, if X is a leg of some horse, then X is a leg of some animal. Now X is a leg means this A is what? All legs. Well, all legs of any horse you take, they are all legs of animals, some animal, okay? but it does not matter now, you can take also some. right? Now, how to write? For each x will come in the beginning anyway, now you forget that. If x is a, so after if, before then, this looks like one formula, x is a leg of some horse, how are you going to symbolize it? Some horse, so there exists a horse yeah. of which X is a leg, right? That's what it is. There exists a horse of which X is a leg, fine. So there exists Y such that H Y and L X. Is that right? So it will be for each X. There exists Y, H Y, and L X Y. Now, since in the predicate we have taken x is a leg of y, we do not have to bother about this a, right. Its meaning is some now, whatever you take. So, a we are not bothered, it comes there on there exists y, where y is a horse, right. Then what will happen? Similarly, the other one, now instead of horse, you have animal. So, you just use the formula, there is y such that a y and l x y, is that ok? If you want to use another variable, you can use there exists z such that a z and h x z, they are same thing. Is this clear? Now, it looks to be valid, how do we give a proof of validity? Problem is here is a premise, here is a conclusion. The conclusion is having only L x y, right? In the premise there is no L x y. So in the informal proof or in the calculation, you have to introduce that L x y somewhere, right? And you don't know where to introduce, how to introduce it. So the best method will be to proceed by redux or absurdum. So you have all the informations. Your target is towards getting the bottom, right? that can be easy. So, this is a strategy which helps many times, because you do not know where to introduce, you know what only to introduce L x y, right. So, if I have all those information, probably they will cancel, give me bottom, right. So, let us start with redux word of sundown. So, this happens if and only if for each x, h x implies a x and it is not that for each x, there is y, h y and l x y implies there is y, a y and l x y. Okay, this enters bottom. It is unsatisfiable, which says that it should enter bottom. Right? So we try a proof of this. Now where should I start? This one is simpler. I can use h y implies a anywhere right so let me start with this one it looks complex fine so second one let me try so first premise is this 
in fact you can write also in the form of a premise and conclusion this way. Now, you have two premises and one conclusion which is bottom. Okay. So, let us start with the premise not for each x there is y h y and l x y implies there is y a y and l x y this is my first premise. So, I will give a comment it is a premise. Okay. Second we should manipulate this hmm. try to have some conclusion from this. So, what conclusion we will get? Yes, starting with a not, I am not able to use anything, right. So, I take that not first inside using De Morgan. So, that says it will change to there is x and not of the whole thing, right. So, not of an implication here, it is not of there is x, it is in the form not of p implies q, right. So, that is p and not q. So, I put directly there is y h y and l x y and not q not there is y a y and l x y. Okay. So, I have to give a comment here what I have used I have used De Morgan and also implication right not implies let me write this way. Okay you have to write it fully then you will write not of p implies q is equivalent to p and not q or in first order logic we assume that you have become matured. So, you know all the propositional laws. So, you just write p l right from propositional tautology we get it. Okay. Next again there is a not here. So, we can take it inside let us try that there is x there is y h y and l x y and for each y not will go inside not of a y and l x y that will be not a y or not l x y or we can write a y implies not l x y. Okay. Again P L and also De Morgan both are used. Is it okay? correct or not verify it. So, this will be not of a y or not l x y this is not a y or not l x y. Next there is y is in the beginning. So, we will be using existential specification, but we cannot just write after this from there is x p x we cannot write p c right, but we can take it as one extra hypothesis. Okay. So, once you take the extra hypothesis you have to note it somewhere that you are taking an extra hypothesis just like in your deduction theorem right and your existential specification begins there with that constant c fine. Suppose I instantiate x to c a constant. So, I would get there is y I would like to introduce this as an extra hypothesis this and for each y a y implies not l c y. Now, I must write existential specification begins with this new constant c. Okay. So, after this block is over if there is no c there whatever is concluded I will accept it that is the procedure right. Within the block whatever is there if it depends on c I can conclude anything that will be dependent on this new premise with this new constant that is the understanding here. Okay. Now, let us see how far we can go we have to use our premise somewhere h x implies a x, but that also requires h y right h of something is needed 
then I can go to A of something, right. So, again another existential specification we may have to do. Before that for each y, but for each y I can differ for longer. I do not know which constant I will take. So, if I use this, I might unnecessarily take one specification which will not be used, right. So, let us not use it now, keep it differing. Now, with this we have say H D and L C D, where this there exists I am only taking. Other things are kept as it is. So, again existential specification begins with the new constant D. Fine. Now, you see L C D is there here not L C Y. So, it suggests that I should take the universal specification with Y as D, right. So, let us take that and existential uh, sorry universal specification follows that is if for each x p x then you get p d it is entitlement right it is not an extra hypothesis. So, we can just introduce as it is this gives h d and l c d and a d implies not l c d. So, here what we have used universal specification with y as d, you can write y as d, y is substituted by d, not in here without the for all y, right, there only you substitute. Next you have L C D and A D implies not L C D, that is modus tollens, right, otherwise you have to write one equivalence, it will give you L C D implies not A D by contraposition, then use modus ponens, right. So, that is equal to taking modus tollens. So, that gives H D and L C D, let us keep it does not matter and from this I get not A D propositional logic P L. If you know the raw, you can write modus tollens, right. If you want to say from where I have got, it is from this, underline it you want to show what it is, right. From these two we get this, you can keep L C D, but it looks we do not need L C D anymore, right. We can even forget it. So, if I forget it will look like this, fine. Now then I have not used the other premise till now, I cannot conclude anything from here, because D has been flagged we say it is a flagged constant now, new constant. So, its block is not over, block will be over only when d is does not appear, but d appears till now. So, I can close the block, right. So, I will introduce the other premise, which is for each x, h x implies a x, okay. this is a premise. Then it is clear what to do after this step we take x as d universal specification right. So, that gives h d implies a d. So, it is universal specification where I have taken x as d. So, we have implicitly followed another convention here. If you are getting a formula from just the last line we are not writing the line number. If it using the remote one then you at least write it mention it because otherwise we cannot read it where from it is coming right. All these are coming from the last line. So, we have not written the line numbers on the justification column right. When you write here for example, P next line I should have written 8 u s x by d from 8 it follows right. Okay. Now, next I have 7 where s d is there right, but s d and not a d here S D implies A D that will give a contradiction right, but I have to make it which way it gives the contradiction. So, first I go for H D it comes from line 7 by okay. So, that is P and Q enters P that is why again not A D similarly. 
parent q enters q okay next from these two i get ad 9 10 mod exponents okay now 13 you have 11 12 gets bottom Okay. Now, once I get bottom, I see that it does not have D, right. So, I can close the existential specification. So, you can write, okay. you have to go for the next line E S E D. See, nesting is there, do not write C here, right. Both are closing there, but you have to go only on the nesting of the loops, nesting of the blocks. So, the last one was introduced as ESBD in line number 5. So, let us write 5 here to say where it is closing. So, it closes with line number 5 ESED. Once it closes, it does not have bottom. So, I could infer bottom, right? 5 and the previous line, it closes there. Next, again I have to write bottom because I have to close the other line. right there it ends is that okay so it is valid uh, so this could not be shown by aristotelian logic because in aristotelian logic it is like all four sentences types of sentences they are having only monadic predicates unary predicates px implies mx or px and mx with for all or there is right and nots used somewhere, but this is having a binary predicate L x y. So, that is why the famous example of De Morgan, it could not be done by Aristotelian logic, we need faster order logic. Is it clear? Now, you can write one calculation also if you want. Hmm? This premise you can introduce later also. Right? in calculations you can go on writing and premise and premise whenever needed you use that right but there is another thing see these blocks esbc esbd we have to take care of this existential block in the calculation this does not follow from the last line right so when you do calculation you have to write another symbol that implies symbol will be writing with indentation right with indentation it says that another block is starting it is a lemma inside a theorem, inside the proof of a theorem, right. So, after that indentation is over, you bring it to left side that close that indentation also, because it says it does not follow from the last line, it follows from after the block is closed, it follows from all the premises, whatever had been used in the proof, right. That is why the block, that is why the indentation. Is that clear what you are going to do? So, here the structure will look like in a calculation, it will start something like all the premises, then you have entails, proceeds, somewhere one implies symbol will come with indentation and it is over, you get some entails bottom, then next line you have to close the indentation with bottom, right? either implies or even entailment, does not matter now. Okay? Once more, this is for the D, D block. Then for the C, again you have to go for entails bottom once more, right. There will be two nested loops with C here, that is how it will look. So, one indentation here, one indentation here, which would have been somewhere which is introduced, okay. So, this will be for C, another will be for D similarly, somewhere. That is how the structure will look. Now, just like your earlier things in propositional logic, suppose you go for a normal form, how do you proceed? See, in propositional logic, we had a normal form which are helpful for proving the completeness of the calculations, right. We proved that completeness of the calculations by converting to normal form, fine. Now, in first order logic, how do you introduce a normal form?
like you wanted to be in the form of conjunctive conjunction of disjunctive clauses or disjunction of conjunctive clauses right so what will be a clause any formula so what are the quantifiers Uh, for example, let us take this for each x p x implies q x. Okay. So, one you may think for each x I have not p x or q x right. In another case I say for each x p x implies for each x q x. So, here if I apply same proportional tautology. I would get not for each x p x or q x. Okay. Now, there is some problem in this form and this form. It is not clear whether we should accept mixed form like this or not. Okay. So, there is one nice way to go about it. The nice way is you take any formula in proportional uh, in first order logic, you can always bring it to a form where all the quantifiers will be in the beginning. It will be something like this. Hmm? Can you bring it for example, this one it is already there. Now, what about this? Yes. Now, how to bring all the quantifiers to the beginning? Well, first thing is you may need to be introducing different variables huh? using renaming, right? You have used renaming. After renaming, for all y, I will bring here. it is not done right because what we want is there should be one place where all the quantifiers will stay right and then from there onwards one formula without quantifiers it is not in that form still right there is some symbol which is before a quantifier is it right there should not be any other symbols only quantifiers using their variables that we accept. Then what should we do? Yeah. See this is a formula where x does not occur. So, you can use the distributive law fine. So, it will be for each y there is x p x implies q y okay. this becomes there is right because you look at this in the this form it will look not for each x p x or q y. So, not for each x p x is same thing as there is x not p x right or q y. So, that there is x goes out now not p x or q y which is p x implies q y, but you do not have to do all those things if you remember the correct distribution law. Right. So, this is how it will be coming, but also you could have done some other way. So, that you can bring to there is x for each y p x implies q y also to this, because I do not take for all y now I keep it there first I pull this. So, that gives there is x p x implies for each y q y now I pull for all y. So, it will be something like this are the same or not well this is an exercise now find out whether they are equivalent or not hmm? but we are getting through equivalences only so each of them individually is not 
But each of them is equivalent to for each x p x implies for each x q x. So, they should be equivalent. Right? It is true that this is not correct. Okay. This is what you are telling. If you take there is x for each y or x y, it is not equivalent to for each y there is x or x y. But it is not of the form r x y. So, think about it. 